War presents people with some pretty hard choices sometimes. How much ammo should I take on patrol? Should the flank go left to right? And is there enough room in my ruck for personal morale boosting gear? But one unique situation might present itself in the face of unsurmountable odds, and that question is, should I surrender or not? Surrendering is a hard choice. If you stay and fight, will it actually have an effect on the outcome of a battle, or will it just leave you dead for no reason? What will happen to the others on my side still fighting, and if I surrender, am I just picking a slow and painful death over a fast one? But how, how do we make that decision easier for the bad guys? Bringing in a prisoner of war is actually a massive win if you can pull it off. It has huge impacts to morale on both sides, can potentially be a great source of information on your enemy, and gives you a political leverage for any negotiations against whoever you're fighting. This is why we hear Zelensky often reference the idea of increasing the POW fund, as it were. But what makes someone want to stop fighting, throw in the towel, and just raise the white flag? Do we just try to explode them until they give up, or are there more sinister, dark psychological tactics we can use? Let's try to find out. One of the first studies done on the phenomenon of surrendering soldiers was done by a guy named Alan Stam, who, after studying every major war between 1815 and 1988, came to two groundbreaking conclusions. Groundbreaking conclusion number one, it's easier to win a war if you have more people than the people you're fighting. Fascinating. Second, POWs are a good source of slave labor. Gap. Damn, get this man a Nobel Prize ASAP. I joke, but the point of this study was basically to try to lay the framework for the argument that getting enemy soldiers to actively surrender should be something you pursue, not just happening on accident. It should be a goal rather than a byproduct of something if that makes sense. Interestingly enough, previous studies on soldiers either surrendering or deserting viewed both of these acts as forms of psychological disorders, and that those who surrender are inherently mentally unbalanced. The thought that was because in war your fellow soldiers are the only people around you, it was equal to abandoning your wife and kids, literally. This was largely backed, and backed with big quotation marks with the idea of looking at the very low desertion rates of Germans in World War II. And I quote, in wartime, the unit is the soldier's only social group, and as such fulfills his primary needs. This includes not only his organic needs for food, rest, and shelter, but also his equally important needs for affection, approval, and rules. The soldier's tendency towards self-preservation in battle is minimized when these primary needs are not met by his unit. Secondary or political considerations mean little to the individual soldier because they do not continue to fight from a larger belief in the war. Rather, they stay and fight out of a loyalty to their unit comrades. This thinking was also supported by historical American and British soldiers who were more likely to surrender or go AWOL if they had a history of truancy in school, were young, or had a mental illness. Mental illness, as we know in the 1940s, was defined by holding the belief that children don't belong in factories, feelings of agnosticism, and being Irish. But the broad idea of the study was the focus on breaking up unit cohesion, and they used the key word here, self-preservation. Being in a tightly knit, well-trained military unit causes people to act altruistically. This means they'll follow orders, trust their commanders, and be courageous in the face of fear. If you're able to tip the scale of soldier motivation from protecting those around them to protecting themselves, you are on your way to collecting a few POWs. It was found that it wasn't necessarily the formal structure of rank and billet that was the goal to break, but the informal cohesion or culture of the unit. One particularly useful strategy to do this, they went on to say, is by targeting a unit's leadership, either literally target them or force your enemy to lose trust in them. And this was found especially true in units built of conscripts rather than volunteer soldiers. But just like everything else in war, your enemy gets a vote. I don't know of a single country that doesn't explicitly lay out what will happen to you if you decide to spark a mutiny, desert, or surrender if there are no immediate reasons to. Spoiler alert, all the punishments for this in wartime lead to blindfolds and firing squads, United States included. Surrendering and deserting come with their own risks. It's a gamble every time. So how do we make that gamble worth it? A 1997 study called The Soldier's Decision to Surrender for the American Political Science Association looked to answer that exact question. Now they used a fancy model with a lot of variables and math, but I'm just going to cover the highlights so I don't bore you to death. They said that in a given battle, a soldier has three options, fight, 
hide, or surrender. Each of these have a cost associated, measured by a binary one meaning good outcome or zero meaning bad outcome. Bad outcome here means somewhere between gulag and dead. If you decided to fight, your two outcomes were to die or to not die, that's simple enough. Similarly, if you stayed but you hid the whole time, you'd either be punished or not punished. But I'd argue with drones these days, there is a third option which is also to die. If we get to the surrender option, it's a lot less binary and there's actually six different outcomes of varying goodness that a soldier can lead to. The first is if the people you're fighting will actually accept your surrender rather than just shoot you on the spot. If raising a white flag will either land you killed or starve to death in a labor camp, you're better off just taking your chances in combat. If you're fighting people that will accept your surrender, this branches off into two different scenarios. The first, you're captured and your side wins. If that happens, you have the choice to attempt to seek asylum in the country you were captured by or be repatriated. But repatriation comes with a risk that you once again face the firing squad because you deserted in wartime. And this tree of possible outcomes is doubled, but with different levels of risk if your side loses while you're still captured. If this is too much A equals B, B equals C stuff, just look at it from a hypothetical North Korean perspective. Dude might want to surrender, but doesn't want to risk his family sent into a labor camp for three generations. That would dissuade him. But say he knew his family was safe, or at the very least, the labor camps would go away if his side lost. If he surrendered, it would help his side lose. So he surrenders knowing that the South Koreans will honor the Hague Convention and accept him as a POW. Now his outcomes are looking pretty good. He helped his side lose, which made his family not at risk for being tortured to death, which means either he seeks asylum or at the the very least, his country is no longer run by God King wannabe Kim, and by virtue that has to be better than what they have now. This is obviously a very simplified example, and there's no telling what 24 hours of multi-generational propaganda will do to a person, but I, it's just what I thought about. But what are the big takeaways here? First, it's important to actually obey the laws of war and not do war crimes. If you know the people you're fighting against won't just torture you and your friends to death, then it makes it a lot easier to convince you to surrender. Next, ensure that the chance of hiding or fighting will lead to a greater chance of death, or at the very least, just not worth it in general. Things like targeting enemy leadership, disrupting supply lines of things like ammunition and food especially, making living conditions as objectively miserable as possible with non-stop harassing fires, artillery strikes, or drone attacks, or by bombing out the squad barbecue. Any sources of personal comfort get punished, like warming fires or cell phone signals. Make your enemy as sad as humanly possible, and you'll know you've succeeded when you hear them start singing Gary Jewell's cover of Mad World. Finally, offer things like asylum and citizenship to the POW that you've taken, entice them to not want to go back into the war. One of the big benefits of treating POWs well isn't that you can just hark on being the good guy, but it keeps POWs from wanting to escape. If you throw them in a camp, but the prison has everything they would need or want, they're just gonna get fat and lazy and want to stay. Kind of like society. Now, everything I just talked about is great, but it's very mathematical thinking. Soldiers considering surrender aren't busting out a pen and paper mid-firefight to draw up a pros and cons list on their current situation. How do you appeal to that monkey brain instinct that will help put people over the top. Psyops. And here I mean like actual psyops, not whatever you guys think it is. I already did a video on that. All military action is intertwined with psychological forces and effects, as Clausewitz once said. According to the 2003 version of FM 3-05.301, the goal of psyops is to influence emotions, objective reasoning, and ultimately behaviors of foreign governments, organizations, and here what we're talking about, individuals. The manual talks a lot about what helps convince a soldier to surrender, but maybe not in ways that you think. They really like the honey over vinegar approach because it states specifically to avoid antagonization, basically saying if you're just mean to the people trying to kill you, it'll make them want to kill you even harder. This makes sense, but the effect is that psyops that are aimed at inducing surrender are never going to be things like, oh, look how big and bad we are and how small you are, plus you smell bad, your country's a shithole, and also fuck your mom. The message you send out has to be non-antagonizing, but it also has to be believable within cultural norms. An example of this in the manual was during the Korean War, broadcasts were sent out to the DPRK troops bragging that North Koreans that had already surrendered ate eggs and bread for every breakfast. While this was true, the North Koreans didn't actually believe that the real troops had eggs, let alone prisoners, so the plan actually backfired. Loudspeaker operations is always a fan favorite when it comes to talking about psyops. People love bringing up things like blasting music on repeat at officials and embassy, or the extra spoopy Halloween noises teams would play in the Vietnam jungle. But sometimes, and this applies for most things in life, 
Sometimes the boring answer is the best. During the Gulf War, coalition forces had successfully isolated a large Iraqi force on Faleka Island, directly assaulting an island with a waterborne beach landing, in case you didn't know, sucks big time and gets a lot of your buddies killed. Opting not to do this, instead a UH-1N helicopter was flown with attached loudspeakers and simply told them that tomorrow morning they all needed to be in formation by their radio tower in order to surrender. Sure enough, the next day, 1,405 Iraqi troops, including their general, were formed up nice and neat ready to go and be taken as POWs. They saw that at that point in the war, the island was going to be lost no matter what they did, so they might as well just pack up and go home. But obviously today, things are a little bit less on the nose. Let me give you a personal example of this. Rewind back to 2020. COVID's going crazy. I'm a lieutenant, and my ass is stuck staring out over the Black Sea in an effort to deter Russia from coming into Europe. This was part of Operation Atlantic Resolve, which was a big tripwire deterrent thing. You can look it up. Whenever I'd call my family back home at around the 22nd mark into the phone call, I'd hear a bunch of weird clicks and beeping. And that weird click and beepings were Russian intelligence tapping into my phone after pinging one of the local cell towers. Now, I'm sure they got so much good information about me calling my mom to complain about the weather in Romania sucking, but they actually would do things that would have real effects to us on the ground. A very common thing that was starting to happen was that people's wives and girlfriends and stuff were getting phone calls and anonymous texts from overseas saying that they were this Bulgarian girlfriend or Romanian prostitute having an affair with their wife or boyfriend. And they would use the information from the tapped phone calls to make the story more believable. It got to the point that we couldn't have contacts in our phone named things like mom, wife, girlfriend. They just had to be the person's name, no relations or anything like that. Because naturally, this was causing problems. I can't think of another scenario that would cause a soldier to switch purely into self-preservation mode than an angry wife. We see a lot of these pathos-styled strategies today. Russian bot farms sowing discontent with leadership on social media. The CIA posting videos looking to turn Russian intelligence agents due to frustration on how the war in Ukraine is going. They're even making Tinder profiles now to discourage fighting against Western militaries by young men who are struggling to get laid apparently. Ukraine offering massive buyouts and rewards for Russians surrendering their vehicles. All of these trying to convince someone to choose themselves over their organization. So to sum it up, this is how you make someone surrender. Number one, make them miserable. Two, make them lose trust and confidence in their leadership and comrades. Three, don't commit war crimes so they're not too scared to surrender. Four, play a little game theory and make it so that choosing to surrender leads ultimately to a better outcome than if they'd stayed and fight. And finally, be nice about it. As the art of war says, build a golden bridge for your enemies to retreat across. I feel like I just barely scratched the surface on this kind of topic and I really want to revisit it again, but I wanted to get this video out this week instead of next week so please like and subscribe so you can see whatever comes after this thank you for watching i'll see you in the next one